Uh, last week, I got a, a Brooke had texted me and said, I can't find the class up on the, online. And I went to Dean O'Neill, who does that. And Dean said, um, uh, they, they, they cut us off. Uh, YouTube shut us down because of copyright infringements. And I thought, what? You know, we didn't play any songs. I showed this picture. And well, what found out, well, yeah, yeah, I wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's not copyrighted, by the way. Uh, but what we, what we discovered was uh, we have a number of uh, Bible investigation class things on YouTube. And once we had so many, they shut us down. Uh, they didn't know that we were the originators and everything else. So anyway, it should work. It should be uh, sort of like today's should be online. But if any of you goes to check it out, you probably won't because you're here. But if you hear of it not being up, let us know because we need to call the YouTube people back to get that taken care of. So that was, that's, we thought it was maybe the picture. This, for those who weren't here, this is a picture of Mount Sinai. And it is uh, the location somewhere around there where God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments. And as Gretchen was with us last week, and Gretchen has been there, and Gretchen said there's a monastery there. And uh, so anyway, if you, I'm hoping that Debbie and I can take one more group to the Holy Land. Um, we thought the last time we went was the last time, but there's just something about going to the Holy Land like, oh, I, I want to go again. And I know there are people who'd like to go who've never been and some who like to go again. So we don't have a date locked in, but we're thinking about it. And so um, I'm going to guess it would be probably... 15 to 18 months out because it takes time to plan. People have to get passports if they don't have them and we have to do, you don't need shots or anything to go to the Holy Land. And normally Mount Sinai is not on the trip because Mount Sinai is in Egypt. And so it's a, you know, it might be a side trip that some people sometimes take. But normally when we go to the Holy Land, uh, we will visit up north in the, what's called the Galilee, uh, where uh, Mount Carmel is located, where Elijah took on the 450 prophets of Baal. Uh, Nazareth, where, where Jesus grew up, is in the Galilee. Uh, Cana, where Jesus turned the water into wine, is in the Galilee. Uh, Capernaum, where Jesus' ministry headquarters were on the Sea of Galilee, were, is in the Galilee. The Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount, is in the Galilee. And then down, then you've got... Um, uh, Samaria beneath, and there's some things in Samaria, but we don't normally go there. There's not a lot. And then down in Judea, where Jerusalem is located, where Bethlehem is located, and we spend time down around there, uh, Jericho, uh, that area. So anyway, we'll uh, we'll let you know if we if we choose to do something like that again. Also, uh, just another reminder: if if you have not been baptized, or if you have children or grandchildren that you'd like to have baptized based upon what we've talked about, please let me know that. There's a baptism form in your workbook. You can fill that out. Uh, you don't have to pick a date. We can talk about a date, um, but we can, we can get that worked out. So I just want to remind you uh, that that's something that we can do. All right, so if you haven't put your name on the white sheet, be sure to do that. And we are on the fourth commandment. Um, Chris, there's workbook, right? Or did they all? Yeah, there's one over there. Go ahead and help yourself. Uh, and if anybody needs an extra one or Bible, they're over there. Uh, so we are on the fourth commandment. What page is that on in yours? 44. Page 44. Okay, so page 44. And uh, we talked about the fourth commandment, which is about honoring those in positions of authority over us. And we left off with Acts chapter 5, verse 29, which says we must obey God rather than men. So the question is, if I, as a child, am to be obedient to my parents, if I, as an employee, am to be obedient to my employer, if I am a citizen, am to be obedient to the government, uh, then do I ever have the, um, the freedom to be disobedient, to not do what they tell me to do? And, and so in Acts 5.29, we have precedent for that, where people were told it was illegal to be a Jesus follower until Constantine in the 4th century um, made Christianity a legal religion. And that's why there was a lot of persecution of the early church. Uh, Nero, the Roman emperor, was persecuting Christians, having them put to death. Uh, but when Constantine then became a Jesus follower, Christianity was then legalized. Um, on one hand, that was a good thing. On another hand, I don't know if it was a good thing. Uh, persecution can be good. Not that any of us likes it. But the church tends to be more healthy and growing where there's some persecution than where it's not. And what happens is, like, you know, we have a connection with the church in India. We've had a connection with the church in India for many years now. And 
And I'm always amazed by what I see in Indian Christians. Their commitment, their, their faithfulness, their dedication. Um, they are uh, under a government that is not friendly to Christians. If you are, uh, the, pr- the predominant faith in uh, India is Hinduism. 85% of India is Hindu. Um, and uh, uh, Muslim, or the Islamic faith, is maybe 12%. So Christianity is very small. Now, there are a lot of them, but because there are over a billion people in India. Uh, but the church is doing some amazing things in India. But if you're an Indian citizen and you're Hindu and you convert to Christianity, uh, you can lose all your benefits that may come to you via the government. So if you are retired and you're, you know, you're receiving health care uh, through government services and you become a Christian, guess what? You lose all that. Uh, and that can be minor compared to the physical persecution that you may face um, in India uh, because of that. India is not friendly as a country to Christians. So uh, it, yet in America, uh, sometimes, you know, it's like, are you, you know, we're sometimes even embarrassed to talk about our faith. Heaven forbid that somebody would, would know me as a Christian. You know, and so what's happened, and I think much of American Christianity this is just my language. I don't mean to offend anybody, but I think we've gotten fat and lazy. I think we have. You know, we get bent out of shape in the United States when they tell us we can't have a Christmas tree on City Hall. So what? Who cares? The fact that there's no Christmas tree. Now, we have a Christmas tree at City Hall, but if that got changed, we'd have all kinds of onions and editorials in the newspaper, right? That we would really be offended. You say, uh, so I would say, those of us who get upset, then let's go, let's go uh, act like Jesus to our non-Christian friends and neighbors and co-workers. Let them encounter Jesus in us, because they're not going to be converted by a Christmas tree on City Hall. Let them encounter the living Christ in us so that they come to know who he is, instead of getting upset that there's no Christmas tree at City Hall. You know, or if, the, if, the, if they take the Ten Commandments off of the stone on the courthouse lawn like has happened in many communities instead of getting upset about that then how about we as jesus followers seek to be obedient to the ten commandments so that the people who observe us see us living a life that's different because stone tablets on the city on the courthouse aren't going to stop anybody from sinning and a christmas tree at city hall isn't going to convert anybody to faith in the baby jesus now i'm not opposed to the Ten Commandments, you know, the courthouse or Christmas tree. I'm just saying we become, we, we tend to forget what's really important. And there's always, there's, there's, some, there's something that's good that comes out of persecution. Um, so, but if the government tells us to, so in this case, they were saying, you can't talk about Jesus, and if you do, we're going to throw you in jail or we're going to kill you. And the response was, we must obey God rather than men. And what God says, I want you to let your light shine for me. I want all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. So, uh, uh, you know, somebody says, I will only buy an American-made car because that's the right thing to do. And somebody else says, listen, I kind of like my Toyota and Honda, even though it's made in America. Uh, No, that's a foreign car. And those those aren't biblical issues. Those may be your personal political issues, whether one should buy uh, a car from a GM product uh, or not. But those aren't biblical issues. You can argue that all you want from a, from a political standpoint. But those are not spiritual issues. Uh, but if the government says, uh, so right now we're dealing with issues like uh, Roe versus Wade. And that is as much a spiritual issue as it is a biblical issue. So in the fifth commandment, thou shalt not murder, we can look in the scriptures where it says that if two men are fighting and a pregnant woman somehow is struck and they're fighting and the unborn child dies, it says life is to be taken for life. Long before the days of ultrasound. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we should execute people who do abortions. I'm not saying that we should bomb abortion clinics. We should not. That is not an attitude that reflects the heart of Jesus. But some are really, you know, the the momentum is growing, and almost everything I hear 
on uh, kind of mainstream TV. Now, I, I, I think it's some people, I had a woman come to me, I don't know, six months ago, and she just was exhausted she, because of all the news that she gets bombarded with, and she's just scared. And I said, do you listen to one of the rather extreme news programs? Yeah. I didn't ask her which end of the extreme. You can interpret that however you want, because there are extremes on both sides. She said, yeah. I said, how much do you listen to that? Oh, most of the day. I said, that's, get rid of it. I said, when, when the COVID thing hit, uh, I was just kind of drawn in to all the stuff, listening to this. And I decided I was going to listen to news no more than 30 minutes a day. And just for fun, Debbie and I decided we would listen to uh, Fox for maybe 10 minutes and uh, MSNBC uh, for uh, 10 minutes, and then we'd listen to a network or PBS. Because if you're listening to Fox all the time, you're not, you're, you're not getting it all. And if you're listening to MSNBC or CNN all the time, you're not getting it all. You're not. They're too, they're, they're, sometimes they don't even cover the same stories. And they definitely don't cover it the same way. So, um, so how do we... Uh, so if the, if the government, in the midst of all... So what are these issues that are spiritual issues and these that are just political or personal opinion? So the issue of abortion is very much a spiritual issue. And there are all kinds of then questions that become very complicated. What about in the case of rape? What about in the case of... It? The very complicated issues. They are very complicated. Um... But the overwhelming majorities that happen in the United States are not about rape or incest. They're not. And by the way, white women have far more abortions than black women, if we want to approach it from a cultural sociological thing. So, uh, so, that's all. so when the government says, so if the government says to me as a, um, let's say I'm a Christian uh, doctor, and I'm in a hospital where abortions are performed, um, and they say, you will do that, then either I have to make the decision, um, I will do that against my conscience because I know what the scriptures say, or I will leave my job here and go to another hospital where I'm not forced to do that. There was a man in my congregation where I was in Iowa, and he was uh, uh, the accountant for, he handled the financials for the company where he worked. And the boss, it wasn't a huge corporation, but the boss came to him and he wanted to fudge on the numbers uh, in a way that would have been dishonest and illegal because he wanted to show a lesser profit, of course, for tax purposes. And there was no, this wasn't, even, this wasn't a loophole. This wasn't a legitimate loophole. This was just outright uh, lying. And, he's, and he came to me and he said, I don't know what to do. I, I, I make a good living here. I don't want to lose my job, but I don't know what to do. So we talked about this, about obeying God versus man. And I didn't tell him what he should do. That was his decision. But he ended up leaving the job because he couldn't with a clear conscience do that. And God provided another place of employment. If you were a soldier in the German army in the days of Hitler, and he said, go round up all the Jews, and you knew what was going to happen, what would you do? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of German Lutherans in Hitler's army. What do you do? So, uh, if we choose to obey God rather than man, then there's a good chance there's going to be a price to be paid. So the man who left his job in the financial department, in that there was a price to be paid. He could have been out of work for six months or a year or two years. But he said, I don't, I don't, this is wrong. I would be, you know, and what, remember the first commandment? First, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Fear means, I, I, it doesn't mean to be scared of him. It means I, I, I don't want to bring displeasure to the heart of God. In everything that I do, I want to bring a smile to the face of God. And he knew, he knew that cheating on those, on those numbers was not going to bring a smile to the face of God. So he said, no, I'm not going to do that. But that required leaving his job. If you were a hit German, you know, German uh, an army in Hitler's army and you say, no, I'm not going to do that, that could cost you your life. So if parents tell children, 
or forbid children to do something that if, if, they, if they forbid what God commands or command what God forbids. If likewise with citizen and government, employee, employer. So that little illustration there simply says, uh, if God commands something, uh, we obey it. If God is silent, we obey it. If God forbids it, we disobey. So silent, speed limit. I have a heavy foot. I like to drive fast. I do. It's just who I am. It's a competition for me. I try not to be obnoxious because people might know who I am when I'm driving in Columbus. I'm serious. I'm serious. The only thing that keeps me from being obnoxious is there's Pastor Tyke. I'm, I mean, I'm competitive. I like to be the first off the line. I don't like to be the third car. If there's three lanes and there's an open lane, I'm going to the open lane. And I kind of like to be the first one off the mark. I'm, I, I'm just being honest. I'm a competitive person. Hopefully I'm not as nasty and mean as I was when I was 20 years old being competitive. I'm competitive, and I like to drive fast. I loved it when I went out to, uh, I was out west about three years ago on a sabbatical, and the speed limit was like 75. I thought, oh, this is great. Because if it's 75, it's like you can do whatever you want, you know? And people did. And, uh, and so, uh, so there's no speed limit in the Bible, right? But if I'm driving up Washington Street and I'm going 47 miles an hour and the speed limit's 30 and I see red lights behind me, my heart ought to start pounding because they have every right. Now, there are some places, like I live on the west end of town. I have no idea why they tell you you have to go 30 miles an hour on that overpass. Because it's ridiculous. <laughs> you're coming, you're doing 50 down Jonathan Moore Pike, and you go up there. Trust me, you can do 50 very easily on that ramp. Of course, if somebody's doing 60 and they go in front of me, it's like, what's your problem, you know? <laughs> but that's because he's in front of me. I try. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your grace. So, so the government's silent, then we obey. If mom says, make your bed, the Bible doesn't say that you have to make your bed, but we obey. But if mom says, go steal a loaf of bread from the store, then we disobey. But there could be consequences to that. So that's kind of the biblical precedent when it comes to how do we deal with those issues um, uh, by way of those in authority over us. And, and remember, when we're in positions of authority uh, as a parent, as a teacher, as an employee, as a government representative, as a, as a pastor, we have to all understand that we have accountability to God for how we carry out our positions of authority and responsibility. So parents are accountable to God for how they deal with their children. Employers likewise. And the government also. The fifth commandment is actually you should not murder. I know we, most of us learn you should not kill, but the word there is murder. And that's appropriate to make note of because there are some taking of human life where the scriptures permit and others where they don't. So, and this only applies to human life. The fifth commandment does not apply to chopping down trees or hunting or fishing. We should be good stewards of creation. God has given to us the responsibility as being stewards of creation. So we shouldn't pollute the waters. We should take care of the air. Uh, we shouldn't just chop down every tree that we see. We shouldn't shoot every living creature that moves. Um, but it doesn't forbid hunting. It doesn't forbid fishing. It doesn't forbid logging. It doesn't forbid those things. But, and, and there's gray. There's, again, gray. And how do, you, how do we seek to be the best stewards of God's creation? But this speaks to uh, human life. So capital punishment, and I don't have time to look up all the scriptures, but capital punishment is permissible according to scriptures. It's not required. And in the United States, so now we've got the Roe versus Wade issue, and if they overturn Roe versus Wade, then it goes back to the states, and then the states decide. Capital punishment is handled in that way. Capital punishment is not a federal mandate that every state has to use capital punishment, but the Supreme Court has said that that's a decision of each state. So in some states, capital punishment is permissible. In other states, capital punishment is not permissible. But biblically speaking, God has given the authority uh, to the government to exercise capital punishment. I'm not saying that we should use capital punishment or that we shouldn't. Um, but you can't, you can't, I mean, as you argue that issue, uh, God gives the government that authority if it so 
uh, chooses. Now, we all, there's all kinds of conversations. What about people who are wrongly found guilty? And, and that's true. So they're, they're hard decisions to make. Uh, but the, the Bible permits the taking of human life through capital punishment. Abortion, uh, abortion is not permissible, uh, biblically speaking. I know this is a hot topic in our country right now. Um, and I remember uh, a young man probably 15, 20 years ago when we were going through this class and we talked about this and I had time to go through in more detail about what the scriptures say about that. And I gave you one example of two men fighting and a woman who's pregnant miscarries. He said, I had no idea. I just always heard kind of the argument about a woman's right. And, and until we opened up the scriptures, he said, I never even considered that. So we can't know the will of God unless we know the word of God. And we need to know what the word of God is. And again, there's all those what ifs, all the hypotheticals. What about in the case of rape? What about in the case of incest? What about in, in uh, you know, all these different kinds of situations? Uh, but the scriptures do speak to that subject. Euthanasia. Euthanasia is not when somebody has, you know, and maybe they've done resuscitation or had artificial life support and they decide to turn that off. Euthanasia is the kind of the Dr. Kevorkian thing of the um, uh, what's called physician-assisted suicide, where they set you up with a, a lethal cocktail, and um, the, the the physician gets you gets everything you need, and you just push the button when you're ready. That's why it's called physician-assisted suicide. So euthanasia and suicide itself would be contrary to the will of God. Um, a uh, suicide, I was, as a child, I was under the impression that suicide was somehow unforgivable. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's what the scriptures teach. Um, many of us know people who have died by suicide. Um, and uh, suicide is not God's desire for us. But I will say to you that having um, spent more time with individuals who live with severe mental illness, I can much more easily appreciate why death by suicide occurs. Um, and if you don't have someone, most of us probably do, have someone close to us who lives with a severe mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, and, uh, but the fact is that those are horrible, horrible diseases. And unless you know somebody uh, who lives with that, then you just really can't comprehend. I used to think, why don't people with these serious mental illnesses, they just take their meds, if they just take their meds, until I then came to realize that many of these meds have horrible side effects, horrible side effects. And if we had the serious mental illness, we probably wouldn't want to take the meds either. And we might not take the meds either. We've got a long ways to go when it comes to treating mental illness. Most of the people that you see on the streets who are homeless suffer from a severe mental illness. Um, and it is, uh, it's a horrible, horrible disease. So I've come to appreciate why, uh, but the Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin, of all sin. And so um, self-defense would not be considered uh, suicide. And again, how do you define that and become sticky? Uh, war, uh, for the sake of defense, would not be considered murder. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, we did not treat our Vietnam veterans very well as a country. Um, we, uh, we appeared to, and I, I'm generalizing, we appeared to welcome back our World War II veterans as heroes, and we tended to you know, throw, rot throw rotten eggs at our Vietnam veterans who came back. Um, war for the sake of defense is not murder. And uh, those who come back from war, where people die, um, a lot of horrible, horrible things in their brains that they deal with as well, post-traumatic stress syndrome and the like, but that's not considered uh, murder. Um, discontinuing life supports is not considered murder. Uh, I've been in a position where I've had to make a decision with another relative in light of a family member um, in regards to that. That's not considered uh, murder. Um, but even Jesus says, if you see somebody who's hungry and you ignore them, <laughs> then that's a breaking of the fifth commandment as well. So murder isn't just about the termination of a life. T murder is about the devaluing of a human life. I consider racism murder. Because it devalues another human being. And when we look upon somebody else as being less than uh, because of the color of their skin or their hair or their language or that's contrary to the fifth commandment. 
fifth commandment is to support and, and lift up and protect and care for human life. So God has called us as Jesus followers to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. What are we doing? So I spent, I had dinner last night with Ward Kumsia, the man who's with us from Bethlehem. And if you weren't in worship yet, he'll be with us at the 1045 service. He was born in Bethlehem. I think I've told you there's a 25-foot wall around the city of Bethlehem with barbed wire on top of it. And at the city gates, there are Israeli soldiers with machine guns. And Ward told the story at 8 o'clock how uh, he, Ward has a 3-year-old son, a 15-month-old daughter. His wife is pregnant now. And um, they went to Bethlehem to have their two older children, or their two children baptized. And he wanted to go from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, but he couldn't. He wasn't allowed. Why? Because he was a Palestinian. Because he wasn't an Israeli. He wasn't Jewish. Um, that's about human rights. That's not about politics. That's about human rights. And as Christians, we are called to speak up for those who are being oppressed. So we're called to speak up for those who don't have a voice. Uh, the oppressed don't have a voice in our society. And over our dinner conversation last night, he said, really, I said, how do Palestinians view Americans? And in that conversation, it was, you know, America doesn't really have any financials to help the Palestinians. There's no real financial benefit to that. There's financial benefit to help Israel, but not Palestinians. And so if we're making our decisions as a nation or as individuals, like what's in it for me? That's not the Jesus way. Jesus went to the cross, not for what was in it for him, but what was in it for us. So we are called as Jesus followers to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves and to take up the cause of, of those who are needy. So fifth, uh, fifth commandment. Uh, there's so much more that could be said. I, so much more. We could spend five weeks just on fifth commandment. Sixth commandment. Um, you should not commit adultery. Now, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. Um, this commandment was really given to us for the protection of marriage. I'm not going to uh, take the time unless I get to the end and I have time to tell the story about Sally and her dad. But the word adultery actually comes from the Greek word porneia. The, the English word adultery comes from the Greek word porneia, from which we get the word pornography. But Porneia, or adultery, is any kind of sexual immorality. So this isn't just cheating on your wife. This is any kind of abuse of the gift of sexuality that God has given to us. And God gave to us this gift of sexuality, boy, of sexual intimacy, to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife in the context of marriage. And once one enters into that relationship called marriage, there's really hardly anything there in the scriptures that define but outside the context of marriage, God says, you know what, I don't want you, this could be harmful for you. And I don't want that to happen to you. I love you. I want the best for you. So this whole gift of sexual intimacy is given to us to be enjoyed within the context of marriage. And I'm saying, Mark, this is the 21st century. I know, but God says that he doesn't change. You know? What was good for his people 3,500 years ago when he, when he put these commandments down are still good for us today. So God's desire is he wants the best for us. He wants the very best for us. Um, sometimes I've told, I, like in confirmation, I'll say to our kids, you know, do any of you know who you're going to marry? You know, they're 14 years old. Well, some of them might think they do because they've got a boyfriend or girlfriend, but chances are that's not who they will marry. Uh, but but th it may be. So anyway, um, I said, what if, what if, God had some supernatural way to communicate to you, this is who you're going to marry. You've not met that person. You're not going to meet them for several years. They live far away from here. But somehow you had the ability to see and watch them in life. You know, like some of these reality shows. And you see them when they're maybe 15 years old being sexually active with this boyfriend or girlfriend, when they're 17 being sexually active with this person and 19 sexually active. How's that making you feel as their future spouse, as you see them being sexually intimate with somebody else. Oh, I don't like that very much. I said, well, the reality is, so why is that? Because you want them to kind of keep themselves for you, right? <laughs> well, so now I'll just reverse that. Uh, one of the th things that we want to be able to do is to give to our spouse. So what happens is, sometimes people are saying, oh, they're, now they're comparing themselves. They've had five different people with whom they've had sex. Well, how do I rank? How do I rate? How do I? There are all kinds of reasons, 
All kinds of reasons why God, in fact, st- there's a research done by a secular researcher that says, they talk about all the different phases in a relationship from the time we meet until the time we're, we're married and all the different phases of communication and sexuality and everything else. And they said that when sexual intimacy occurs, and where do you draw the line between you know, holding hands or a little peck on the cheek all the way to sexual intercourse and everything else that comes in between there, but, but when the sexual intercourse occurs, that all of a sudden these other components that are used to build a healthy relationship, that they're stopped. They kind of stop. So if t- people are, you know, uh, early in their, in their relationship, they become sexually intimate, that the other phases of, of relationship intimacy, not in a sexual way, but intimacy, they never develop. So I think when God had these words written down a long, long time ago, he knew what he was talking about. So God's desires, he wants the best for us. He wants the best for us. And I don't say that to beat up on anybody because uh, I don't have any stones to throw. You know, Jesus said, uh, let, uh, said you know, you should not commit adultery. And the Pharisees are saying, oh, we've never, we, we wouldn't do that. And he says, but I tell you, if you look upon somebody with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. So none of, I, none of us has stones to throw at anybody else. And, and for some of us, we're kind of, we're down the road, you know, in, in life. You know, there's a lot of things that are behind us. But I think these are lessons that we can teach to our children and to our grandchildren when it comes to, uh, to some of these kinds of things. So when we go back to whether it's um, Fifth Commandment, um, remember that the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. So if somebody, as I'm talking about abortion, and maybe somebody's had an abortion or they've encouraged an abortion, what I'm saying to you is the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all of our sin. If somebody um, has um, uh, been sexually active before marriage, um, the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all of our sin. Uh, If somebody struggles with pornography, uh, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. You know, in uh, the book of Proverbs, it says, uh, you know, that our wife, what is, I, think, I think the language is uh, of, your, of your wife, of your youth, may, 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 her, may the, wa- the breasts of your wife or your youth satisfy you. In other words, we don't have to, you know, go online. and. So all these different things, God says, this is for your good. I love you. I want what's best for you. So marriage is, it says there are two requirements. Uh, marriage, to, the way the Bible defines marriage is a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. That's the way the Bible defines marriage. A lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. So, so um, I had a conversation with someone recently um, who said um, that they were getting very serious with somebody and that uh, this other person, uh, based upon the um, encouragement of their parents, said, we think you should live with this person for a year before you get married. Because both the parents had been divorced with bad relationships and they thought it was best for their children, for their children, some of you look at me like, what? Yeah, that their children, then before they get married, should live with their future, potential future spouse for a year to make sure they're compatible. And the person who came to me grew up in an environment where that was not like, no, that's really, (laughs) and so this person feels like caught in the middle. So you've got, you know, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend over here with a different understanding, their parents with a different understanding, but this person's parents with a contrary understanding, over, what do I do? So we spent time unpacking that and talking about that. Um, and I understand, you know, th- th- this person's parents were saying, we've been through bad marriages, we didn't know each other as well as we should have, and so we think you should get to know each other. And yet... Again, the statistics that are from secular researchers, not, not church institutions, say that for those who live together and then get married, there's a higher divorce rate than for those who get married without having first lived together. So, uh, and that doesn't mean that if you live together that you're automatically cursed, you know, with a divorce. Um, but, and I understand, I understand the logic of this once, I understand the logic. It's just that sometimes God goes beyond logic on things. So, uh, but the blood of Jesus cleanses us. 
So as I say these things, remember I said how the Ten Commandments can serve as a curb to kind of bring us back in line or a mirror to say, no, you're not quite as good as you thought or a guide as to how to live. So understand, when I, when I lay these things out, these are given to us by God who loves us and he wants the best for us. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us. What's past is past. We can't change that. But he says, this is what is for your good. This is, remember, the holding of the hand, the connection. God says, look, take a walk with me. This is how we stay most closely connected because this is what I want for you. This is the best for you. And what's behind us is behind us. Um, so living together apart from marriage, apart, living together does not constitute marriage because marriage is a lifelong commitment. And so in this case, these, uh, there was conversation about living together so that if we don't get along, then we can split, right? Without having to go through all the legal stuff. So living together does not constitute marriage. It's the commitment that one makes to one another uh, to say this was what, and between a man and a woman. Um, and so uh, I, 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 I don't believe that being gay is a choice. Some of you may disagree with that. Some of you may wholeheartedly agree with that. I don't believe being gay is a choice. Um, the people I know who are gay, I remember I had a conversation. I bet I spent two and a half hours to three hours at the home of a couple of guys uh, who were in a relationship with one another. Uh, one has since passed away. And I, I, to say to them, listen, because I knew them, uh, I, I knew them from different activities in town, and I said, guys, I'm, I'm about as straight as straight can get, but I would love to understand your world. What's it like being gay? Help me understand. And so I went out to the house and spent a lot of time listening, and they said to me, if we could go and like flip a switch and be straight, we would, both of us. Because it'd be a whole lot simpler being straight than to be gay. I don't know people who are gay who said, I think I just want to be defiant and upset my parents. I'm just going to go be gay. I don't know anybody like that. Um, now, I know some people who are gay who have chosen to marry one another. I know some people who are gay who have chosen to be abstinent. Um, and I can't enter into their world. I think it helps us to enter into the world of people who are gay or have mental illness or who live with addiction or who have other things in life that it's easy to... These aren't issues of character oftentimes. Addiction is not an issue of character. Mental health, mental illness is not an issue of character. To be gay, I don't believe that it's a sin to be gay. But I think God's desirable way of sexual intimacy is that it's reserved for a husband-wife relationship. So we can throw stones at those who are gay or lesbian who are sexually intimate. But the same, biblically speaking, applies to those who are straight who are not married who are sexually intimate. Marriage, uh, sexual intimacy is to be reserved, the Bible says, within the context of marriage between a man and a woman. But I really like those guys who are gay. And they're my friends. And if you started making fun of them, I would come to their defense. But biblically speaking, marriage is a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. But I think we should speak up for those who are gay. Maybe that sounds contradictory to you. They're human beings. Both of these men looked at Jesus as a savior. Both of these men recognized uh, their sin in all of life. But they both looked at Jesus as Savior. Um, uh, Genesis 2 says God established the relationship called marriage. So when we talk about marriage, it's a God thing. It's not Mark making up a definition. It's not the Lutheran Church making up a definition, not the Pope. Uh, the scriptures do that. Within the marriage relationship, both husband and wife are to submit to one another. It says in Ephesians 5, submit to one another. Sometimes in a wedding, people want to throw that verse out. Because a lot of times pastors will just say, wives, submit to your husbands as of the Lord. But before it says that, it says submit to one another. And the word submit was a military term in biblical days, and it talked about rank. 
So, you know, you've got, you know, the army, you've got the general, you've got the private, and you've got everybody else. To, to submit means that I'm to rank my wife's needs above my own. I'm to seek to serve her, and she's to seek to serve me. That's all it means. And it says submit to each other. So it's not about 50-50. It's not about, well, you gave, I, I gave in last time. You have to give in this time. It's about ranking the needs of our spouse above our own. It doesn't mean that we're a doormat. It doesn't mean that we never say, hey, how come you never, how come I'm always, let's talk about this. But it's about seeking to serve one another. That's a biblical principle for marriage. The Sixth Commandment is about marriage. Um, and uh, so it's, I says there, submit means to serve. And then God measures the love of a husband and wife for each other by their actions toward one another. So it says love is being patient. Love is being kind. So when God measures my love for my wife, it's not on the basis of how I feel about her. Sometimes I may have nice, warm feelings about her. Sometimes I may not want to be in the same house with her. Maybe that's not true of any of you in your marriages, but it's true of Mark and Debbie. I mean, not, not all the time, not most of the time, but it happens. But he measures my love for Debbie as to how I treat her. So that when I don't want to be in the same house with her, uh, what do I say to her? How am I treating her? Am I yelling at her, screaming at her, humiliating her, belittling her, hitting her? So God measures a love for husband and wife based upon how they treat one another, not on how they feel about each other. Because we all know after any length of time in marriage, the emotions go up and they go down and sometimes they're flatlined, but it's about how do we treat one another. Okay? So um, the choosing of a spouse, also in a sixth commandment, talks about being equally yoked. It means that the husband and the wife should both be connected to Jesus. Uh, equally yoked is that if you were in biblical times, they didn't have John Deere tractors, but they had the oxen that would pull the plow, and the plow had a wooden yoke. I mean, the ox had a wooden yoke over them. It would keep them together, walking in the same direction. So if you had an ox here, an ox here, and no yoke, one ox may want to walk off in this direction, and the other ox in this direction, and they're, they're not pulling together. To be equally yoked says God's desire is that Jesus' followers marry Jesus' followers. doesn't mean that we're better than non-Jesus followers, but it means that we're going to be much more successful and effective in life if we're both seeking to walk in his direction. So it doesn't mean Lutherans have to marry Lutherans or Baptists have to marry Baptists, but it says Jesus' followers should marry Jesus' followers. Christy? I have a comment on that. Uh-huh. Well, and, and I think you can always have conversations. I, I remember a young man coming to me. This was in, in Iowa. I tell Iowa stories instead of Indiana because it's too small of a town here. Uh, but a young man who was uh, probably in his mid-20s, and he'd met a gal, and he really liked her. He loved her. And he wanted to marry her, but she wasn't a believer. She wasn't antagonistic. She just wasn't a believer. And uh, so um, uh, he was going to invite her because we were doing a class like this with the hope that the Holy Spirit would get a hold of her heart. And because if not, if she still didn't want anything to do with it, he thought, I can't. Now, don't, I don't sit down with our young people and like in their face. You know, I'm just laying out what the scriptures say. And fortunately, she came to faith and they, they married and they're still married. Um, I talked to, uh, uh, yeah, I always say marriage is not a good evangelism pro, uh, you know, tool. Um, you should discuss those issues before you get married. And if the other person wants nothing to do with those things, you know, I can remember uh, women telling me um, who married an unbelieving husband and then they had kids and then the difficulty of all of that. And two, you know, because she was going this way and he was going this way. And, and uh, it's interesting 
that the Catholic Church did a study many years ago. They spent millions of dollars. They were trying to prove that if you sent your kids to a Catholic school or parochial school, that they as adults would be more active and involved in the life of the church. And what they found was that that wasn't the case. I mean, it's not anti-parochial school. I think there's a good reason why we have a school, and I think it does great things. But what they found was if both, it was more the parental influence on the kid's spiritual development, and it ties into what you're saying about being equally yoked. So if both mom and dad live out the Christian faith, and not just go to church, but they live out the faith, and that's important to them, about 75 to 80% of the kids when they become adults will stay active in the life of the church and live that out. If just dad goes to church, and that's his faith, and he lives it out, but mom doesn't want anything to do with it, then about 50% of the kids uh, are active and involved in the life of the church. If just mom uh, is a part of the faith, and dad has nothing to do with it, only about 15%. So dad's role in a home is huge. It doesn't mean that dad's more important, it doesn't mean he's smarter or anything else, but I think the statistics show, uh, again, the concept of being equally yoked. In an equally yoked marriage, there's a much greater chance of the kids... Uh, taking that seriously and living that out. Uh, so, and I've had, as I say, women come to me and say, I wished I would have either known it or thought about it. You know, they may have heard it and it went in one ear and out the other. Or maybe they were just so in love, you know, and that happens. You know, you just get head over heels in love that we're blinded to that. Um, but yeah, that, so I think, again, that's something that we can share with our kids and our grandchildren. So I never told my kids who they could or couldn't date. But they knew that that aspect of faith was really important by way of choosing a life partner. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find that of, more often than not, uh, at least in the weddings that I've done, that women have chosen to marry unbelieving husbands, uh, or unbelieving men as opposed to the other way around. But the one example of that one man back in Iowa who said, she's not a believer, but I want to give her every opportunity possible. And it's not a matter of being judgmental. It's not a matter of saying that she's not. It's a matter of sharing. Like, you know, if let's say you wanted to have six kids and the person that you were dating hated kids. Would you marry them? I mean, probably not. Probably not. Um, I mean, sometimes people who are Republicans can't marry people who are Democrats, <laughs> let alone other things that are probably more important, you know. So, um, seventh commandment, uh, seventh commandment, you shall not steal. Uh, you know, so we know, don't go to the store and put a stake inside your jacket and walk out. Uh, but also, you know, don't use any dishonest standards, it says there, by way of length. You know, if you're working at the meat counter and somebody orders a pound of meat, don't give them three quarters of a pound and put your thumb on the scale to make it look like a pound. If, if you're selling a car, if you're selling a used car, and you know the battery is bad, and somebody comes over, uh, and they say, well, how does it work? Oh, it runs great. Everything's great. Because you just charge the battery, and then they get it home, and they realize the bat that's stealing. You know, if somebody comes to buy your house, and you have water that comes in the basement all the time, and so you paint all the water marks on the basement walls and everything. You ever have water? Oh, no, we've never had water. That's never been an issue. That's stealing. That's stealing. So just be honest. You know, when you go to work, uh, are, you, are you working for your wage? You know, or are you working, are you getting paid eight hours a day and working four hours a day? But giving the impression you're working eight. Now, maybe you work on the assembly line and there, there aren't a lot of parts coming through. And maybe you do only work for half a day, but the boss knows that and everybody else. So if we're not, if we're not working faithfully, uh, we're, we're stealing in all of that. Uh, and then Psalm 37, the wicked borrow and do not repay. Um, if, we, if we take out a loan, repay it. There's a responsibility for that. One of the things that I find has caused a lot of problems in families and among friends is somebody will want to borrow uh, money. They, maybe they need some help. And then they borrow from family. And then they, they don't repay or they can't repay. And then it causes a rift in the family. Here's the policy Debbie and I have taken. And I, it's for us, it's worked. So if we have people that we know who are in financial need, and if we, we just give it to them. We just, it's because a whole lot easier just to give it to them than to expect repay. If they want to repay, we never say don't repay. You know, so if I'm going to loan, if Chris needs, you know, $1,000, uh, Debbie and I will, you know, do that. Um, and Chris says, oh, I'll repay you. And we don't say, oh, no, no, you don't have to do that. And we'll just say, Chris, you know, as you can or whatever you think. And if we never get a penny back, we're not upset because we just, 
we're not counting on that. It's just bonus if we, if we get anything back. So I, I would say that if you are in a family situation where you're trying to, you know, help somebody out, uh, you have to make that decision. If you can't live with not being paid back, then don't loan them the money. Just don't do it. Because the relationship is more important than the money, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, and then the Eighth Commandment uh, talks about you should not give false testimony against your neighbor. It means don't gossip about people. I mean, don't go around telling lies about people. It says in Proverbs 19, a false witness will not go unpunished. It says in Proverbs 11, a gossip betrays a confidence. Um, uh, James in James 3, 111 says, uh, it talks about the importance of taming our tongue. You know, we can be in church in here and sing songs of praise and be all godly and then walk out in the parking lot and say, did you see what she wore to church today? <laughs> the tongue. This little thing, like a, a rudder on the back of a ship. You know, it's little, but it can see the... And the tongue, the same thing. We can use our tongue to sing praises to God, but we can also turn around and just start slicing and dicing people. And bearing false witness. So, so sometimes, you know, it may be the truth. You may tell the truth about somebody, but it maybe it was inappropriate to even say it. So uh, we just have to be very cautious about that. And then the 10th commandment is uh, about not coveting. The ninth and 10th commandments deal with coveting. And to covet means to want something at the expense of another. So it's not wrong for me if I'm going out for the high school baseball team to try to make shortstop, but if there's another guy who's equal talent to me, and, uh, and so I want to play shortstop, so we're taking batting practice, and I'm pitching, and I hit the guy in the head intentionally to hurt him so that he can't beat me out at shortstop, that's coveting. That's trying to get something at the expense of another. If 10 girls are going out for cheerleading, they can only keep eight, and, uh, and uh, some of the girls are kind of close in their ability, and, the, and one girl starts spreading nasty rumors and gossip about another girl, which gets her cut from the team, that's coveting. It's nothing, nothing wrong with wanting to make the team. It's when we seek to get things at the expense of other people. In the job world, you know, where there's a position open, and we start, start spreading rumors, or we start, you know, talking bad about the person that we're in a competition with. That's coveting. There's nothing wrong with wanting the job. The issue is when we seek to get something at the expense of another. You know, my uncle has a little yellow Corvette. I can't believe it. He's, he's just cheap as can be, and he drives a little yellow Corvette. So coveting would be, oh, I'd love to have that little, or I would be in big trouble if I had a Corvette. But, <laughs> but you know, to, uh, to say, oh, I hope my uncle dies so I can have that Corvette, you know, or I'm going to, you know, give him a shot of something, that's coveting. That's also murdering, but... Um, <laughs> Sorry, Uncle Howie, I love you. Uh, so anyway, so we got through those commandments really fast, didn't we? So as we wrap that up, because I know where we, we got two more weeks and I know what we have to cover. So um, uh, the commandments. I've broken all ten. I've not always put God first in my life. I have not always used his name properly. I at times have uh, not, uh, the Sabbath, I have not always done what I need to do there. I've not always honored those in authority over me. I have not always sought to protect and defend and care for the lives of others. Uh, adultery, I have not always, I've not cheated on my wife, but I've, I've broken that commandment. Uh, I've not always been honest in the seventh commandment. I think when I was about eight, I stole some bubble gum from a dime store once. Uh, but, um, uh, and I've, I've sometimes gossiped about others. And I've, there are times where I've tried to get things at the expense of... So I've broken all ten. You're probably better people than I am. But I have a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And it doesn't give me authority and license to go out and break commandments. But the Apostle Paul said, the good I want to do, I don't always do. And the evil that I don't want to do is sometimes exactly what I do. And I think, oh. But the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. So, and our call is, to, he says, take a hold of my hand, let me show you a better way. And it's going to be better for you, it's going to be better for your family, it's going to be better for people who you hang out with, let me show you a better way. Two more weeks, we're back on track. I know I sped through that, but we're back on track. So I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Chris, again, thank you for being with us today, um, and let's, uh, let's close with a prayer. Father, thank you. Uh, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know those things that we otherwise maybe keep hidden very well from others. Um, but you know all about us. And then you even know the motivation. You know what's in our mind 
when we do or say the things that we do that may not always be pleasing. And we thank you uh, for the gift of your son. We thank you for his blood that every single day brings us cleansing. And we thank you that you very patiently extend your hand to say, come here and take a hold of my hand. Let's go for a walk and let me just show you a better way. So God, may these commandments, may they serve as a guardrail for us as we go forward. May they serve as a mirror for us going forward. May they also serve as a guide uh, going forward. And, uh, and may you, Lord, use us to seek to be a blessing to those around us. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming.